tonight on CBC Vancouver News. There's less joy riding, that's for sure. Uh, well, <laughs> I gotta pay, so. Pain at the pump. Gas prices in Metro Vancouver hit an all-time high. Also, stress levels just through the roof all the time for months after months after month. Six years, five eviction attempts. Why a Vancouver landlord is trying to get rid of tenants and... One of the main things we need is to get a protected bike lane from, from this point extended through to Burrard. Cyclists push for more improvements to make busy Vancouver intersections safer. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. You can now add gas prices to the list of records being set in Metro Vancouver. Price at the pump hit an all-time high today, and it could keep going up. As Tina Lovegreen is finding out, the high cost of fuel is forcing some drivers to change their habits. 138 and 148. Taxi driver Colwinder Monday pulls into this gas station on East 1st, but he's not filling up his car. Instead, he parks here, waiting for a call to pop up nearby. I just want to stand here like a bit. I don't want to drive anymore. Like, I'm going to stay in the zone. I don't like look for the like a flag so I can stay and save the gas. With prices so high, it's cheaper to wait than to drive around looking for customers. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like under uh, like 30, 130, then it's okay. Then you can cruise around. But this kind of uh, price, 161, I want. Around Metro Vancouver, gas prices varying. Anywhere from 155.9, moving up and up and up, all the way to 167.9 in Coquitlam, a record high. Uh, they definitely have skyrocketed, you know. The pain at the pump, real for drivers. I have no choice. I take my kid to the doctor right now, so I, I, I need it, so I gotta go. The prices are forcing some to turn to cheaper options. I mean, I don't make that much money, so I'm just gonna drive my scooter, I guess. All I got. Analysts say a squeeze on supply is pushing gas prices up. What we uh, are experiencing here today is a reflection of the shortage of gasoline uh, in the Pacific Northwest and generally in the U.S. West Coast. Some also blaming the increase to the carbon tax this week. But Premier John Horrigan on the defense, saying that's not a factor. The carbon tax went up one penny on Monday. And that does not reconcile with a 12 or 13 or 14 cent increase uh, throughout the week. He claims the government will keep an eye on prices this summer. And if there is an opportunity to step in, it will. I have experience of 10 years. But when you need gas to earn a living, you do the math and save where you can. I have to go back there. Okay. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Burrard and Pacific, Dunsmuir and Hornby, they have been identified as two of the most dangerous intersections in Vancouver for cyclists. And with more bikes hitting the road as the weather gets better, there are calls for the city to bring in more safety measures. The CBC's John Paolo Mendoza reports. It's one of the busiest intersections in downtown Vancouver for cyclists, but this bike lane has a big gap. So the factor here is that the Dunsmuir bike lane ends at this intersection. There's no protected bike lane heading west of Hornby. That forces cyclists into vehicle traffic on Burrard Street, and for riders coming from Burrard, there's few options. So they have a choice of walking their bike, riding illegally on the sidewalk, or riding illegally the wrong way up the painted bike lane. Um, we've highlighted this to the city and one of the main things we need is to get a protected bike lane from, from this point extended through to Burrard. In the list of the top 10 intersections for crashes involving cyclists, this ranks second. The area with the most crashes recorded? The Burrard Bridge on-ramp at Pacific Street. Burrard Pacific is the highest collision location in the city, uh, actually in the province, uh, but very significant changes to that intersection. Uh, have really um, made a big difference in terms of reduced collisions. As the weather improves and more cyclists hit the road, advocates say outstanding issues need to be addressed quickly. This protected lane that is safe needs to be carried on one block further. It needs to reach to Burrard Street. Burrard Street is an employment hub. It, there's a lot of people on Burrard that want to get to this bike lane. It's not just crash data the city looks at when deciding which bike routes need improvement. Improving road design matters too. They might be uh, dealing with uneven road surface, or poor lighting um, or some other factor uh, that is contributing to that collision. 
ICBC's data only shows crashes resulting in claims. The city says they also look at data gathered from hospitals and plan safety upgrades around the most dangerous spots. The city says they are looking at upgrading several of the intersections on the list, but didn't provide specifics as to when. In the meantime, cycling advocates want riders to be extra cautious. John Paula Mendoza, CBC News, Vancouver. We now know the name of the woman shot near a busy street in North Vancouver. It happened Tuesday morning and police are still trying to find the shooter. CBC Vancouver News at 11 host Dan Burrett joins us live now with more. Dan, who is the victim? Mike Anita, her name is Anita Nguyen and homicide investigators say she's not going to survive. Police say they were called to a shooting just before 11 a.m. Tuesday at Lonsdale Avenue near 11th Street. They found 32-year-old Anita Nguyen shot there. She was rushed to hospital and placed on life support. IHIT says she has non-survivable injuries. Police now say her shooting was targeted, and they're trying to figure out why someone went after her. They do say she has had interactions with police in the past. We don't know much about her, but she is the mother of a young child, and a look at her now shut down Facebook page indicates she has ties to a local food prep company near to where she was found injured. Again, IHIT is asking for anyone who has any information about a needed win or why she was shot to contact them or Crime Stoppers if they want to stay anonymous. Again, police say a needed win, still a life support, is not going to live. Mike, Anita? All right, Dan Burrett reporting live tonight. Thanks. Six men have been convicted of manslaughter in an execution-style killing in East Vancouver. In September of 2016, Samantha Lee and Zwan Van Vai Ba Kao were killed when the men showed up at a home to kidnap and extort a drug dealer. They held him hostage for 45 hours. And Lee and Bao Kao were innocent victims. Some of the six men claimed they weren't involved in the shooting. The judge couldn't determine exactly who fired the weapon and found all six guilty of manslaughter. They were also convicted of kidnapping, extortion and aggravated assault. The six will be sentenced later. We are learning more tonight about charges against a man accused of sexually assaulting children in B.C. and Ontario as police search for more possible victims. 33-year-old Wesley Clarkson is facing multiple counts of sexual assault here in B.C. The alleged offenses involve three children under 10 years old and happened in Penticton, Naramata, and New Westminster between 2008 and 2010. Clarkson is facing similar charges in Windsor, where he's alleged to have sexually assaulted the daughter of a friend earlier this year. It's not the first time he's been accused of such crimes. In 2015, Clarkson was convicted of similar offenses while working as a babysitter in Wallaceburg, Ontario. New Westminster police believe there may be more victims. They're urging anyone with information to contact them. A daycare in Langford, where an 11-month-old girl suffered a serious head injury last month, has had its license suspended. Her family was told she fell and hit her head on a coffee table. When contacted by the CBC, Island Health would not say why Amy's Angels Daycare had its license suspended or how long the suspension would be lasting. The family confirms it's the same daycare where the incident happened. The daycare did not respond to calls from CBC News. The little girl was released from hospital today. West Shore RCMP are investigating the circumstances of how the child was injured. Well, there's a new tool to help keep track of prescriptions. Accidental drug poisonings send nearly 4,000 people to hospital every year, many of them seniors. But a new campaign is looking to reduce that number with the help of medication cards that can be reviewed by a pharmacist. Still, not everyone is convinced it'll work. And we've provided this little wallet card to individuals so that they can list all of the medications, talk about the strength of the dose, how frequently they take it, and when it's supposed to start and stop. So if you're older, unless you have someone to help you. The cards can be downloaded online or picked up at participating London Drugs pharmacies. And an update tonight on a CBC News Toronto Star joint investigation on breast implants. Health Canada says it may soon suspend sales of a type of breast implant linked to cancer. The federal government says it has been notified of 28 confirmed cases as serious, but a rare type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. 24 of those cases involved Allergan's BioCell breast implant. The company's been given 15 days to respond.
A young woman with severe epilepsy is continuing her sit-in tonight at Vancouver General Hospital. She's refusing to leave until emergency funding is found to provide care for her at home. But so far, her call for help from BC's health minister is falling on deaf ears. Eric Rankin has the latest, and again tonight, a warning. His story contains images of seizures that might disturb some viewers. I'm determined to the point where I'm risking my freedom. And I need to make a change for epilepsy. Day two of Tavia Marlette's refusal to be discharged, saying if police have to be called to remove her from VGH, she's willing to risk a criminal record. The 22-year-old did make a concession today, moving from one of only two beds in the hospital's seizure monitoring ward, which she calls a precious resource, to a bed in the neurological care unit. Tavia has severe epilepsy with up to 50 seizures a day from mild to grand mal. She was in VGH to see if the cause could be pinpointed, but doctors ruled brain surgery isn't an option. Uh, your medications came. Tavia is refusing to return to her family's Langley home until the local health authority, Fraser Health, puts an in-home care plan in place. Tavia says without funding, her mother, a trained special needs caregiver, will have to take unpaid leave from work to make sure she doesn't convulse and die. Fraser Health has said there's no provision for that kind of funding, and Tavia should go into institutional care. BC's health minister refuses to intervene. The system is actually uh, quite flexible and has, and has options, although it doesn't have an indefinite number of options. It didn't say anything to me. It, it just, they seem to be buying time with their comment. Late today, a development. Vancouver General Hospital management proposing a compromise. The Tavia moved to Langley Hospital, closer to her home, where the home care issue can be worked out. But Tavia's mother worries it might be a case of Vancouver dumping the problem back where it began, in Langley, with Fraser Health. Her concern is that we leave and we kind of get more of the same and end up at home in the same situation, and that seems to be her fear. And Renee says she's disappointed the health minister isn't willing to look at funding solutions for families struggling to look after loved ones at home. If the Minister of Health, of all people, can't uh, influence change, um, I guess I wonder why do we have a Minister of Health? For now, Tavia's hospital bed remains her battleground. Eric Rankin, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, it was a welcome change to see a little bit of sunshine yeah, today. very nice today. Unexpected that mm -hmm. it was going to be so nice. Loved it. Amy Bell is here now with the first look at the weather. Thanks, Anita. We did have a fairly decent day after yesterday's rain, but it's in between systems, so we're going to get back into the rain uh, by tomorrow night, uh, or by tomorrow. So what we're going to see overnight is this next system moving in. It's coming up just off the west coast, and this system much more organized and much more powerful than the one we previously saw. So that means we're going to have much more rain, and we will see some winds generating with it as well. So we're going to keep an eye on Saturday. That's when I think those winds are going to be gusting the strongest, especially along the west side of Vancouver Island. So Tofino expected to have the heaviest rain or around that area, but we're also going to throw in those gusty winds up to about 70 kilometers an hour. So certainly a potential to do some damage. Saturday will also be the cool one of the bunch. We've been well above the seasonal average for several days. We had all that heat over spring break, but we will see things tapering down to about 10 degrees by the time we're done on Saturday, but then rapidly rebounding. So Tam's the only one that's going to sort of have the potential to dip down below average before we see things warming back up. So even though it's going to be wet, we are going to stay on the mild side. So just timing it out overnight, uh, early, early tomorrow morning is when we're going to see that system generating. We'll see a high of about 13 degrees. And then overnight Friday and very early Saturday is when those winds have the potential to really gust along the coast of Vancouver Island and then make its way in towards us uh, on the mainland. So in for a stormy Saturday and just wet until early next week. Not looking forward to it, Amy. <laughs> Thanks very much. All right, we wanted to let you know our newscast schedule is going to be affected by the upcoming NHL hockey playoffs. Starting next Wednesday, we will have a 30-minute web-only newscast at 6 o'clock every night. Yes, so make mm -hmm. sure you are following us on YouTube and Facebook at CBC Vancouver and have our website, cbc.ca slash bc, bookmarked. If you have to watch us on TV, we'll typically be on later in the evening after the games are done or in between games. Mm -hmm. Well, six years, five eviction attempts coming up 
why the landlord of this Vancouver home is trying to get rid of his tenants. Thanks so much for watching us tonight live online. In a few minutes, we'll have a look at the latest home sale stats in the Fraser Valley once the show gets back. Yeah, they're kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but for tonight's Throwback Thursday, we're going all the way back to 1982 when, you ready for this? $200,000 could buy you a home in Vancouver. Wow. This is Georges Tremel in Vancouver, where house prices have dropped at least 30% since the boom of last year. John McLaughlin moved back to Vancouver last fall. He paid $235,000 for this three-bedroom house. Today, it is worth $60,000 less, and its value might still be going down. I like the house. Um, the area is one that I always wanted to live in, and I could afford it at the time, albeit uh, marginally. And uh, as long as the economy doesn't play any... Um, doesn't wreak complete havoc with uh, either my income or my wife's income, uh, we'll, we'll, we will be able to continue to afford it. The loss of an income can be disastrous. Selling the house can be impossible. If it has lost so much value, it is worth less than the mortgage on it. Real estate agents won't list it, and nobody will buy. The boom peaked with last year's high interest rates. Demand dropped off. Prices began to fall, especially the price of land. A building lot now sells for half of what it sold last year. Lower prices mean young couples looking for their first home are now buying again. This three-bedroom house in Port Coquitlam would have cost $150,000 a year ago. The butchers paid $93,000. It really scared us to uh, all of a sudden be this much in debt, but uh, we're happy we did. And we had it all worked out so that although we both are working, um, that we could manage on one salary, making the payments. Mm -hmm. Has it proven to be that way so far? Uh, well, well, how many payments have we made? <laughs> We've made two payments, so... So far, not, so not too yeah. bad. The Vancouver market is now slowly getting back to normal. That's fine for the families who bought before the boom or are buying now. The families who bought at the peak can only wonder if and when they will recoup their losses. I'd like to talk to them now. Yeah, it would be interesting. I mean, uh, I love how he phrases it as the boom, which it was at the time. Yes. The boom, <laughs> compared to now. But not the boom that yeah, has gone out. Yeah, exactly. It's fun to look at that stuff, though, I tell you. Mm -hmm. Well, stay with us. Uh, our Justin McElroy is back from his Metro Matters Mackle Road trip around the province, looking at civic uh, affairs in different communities. He's going to be reporting on the potential sale of Tinseltown in just a few minutes. Notice after notice, and now another one. Mm. Two renters of a downtown Vancouver home have been facing eviction for six years. As the CBC's Rafferty Baker reports, officials don't believe the landlord is acting in good faith. I just want it to stop. 67-year-old Dave Brighton has lived here for 15 years. In the last six years, his landlord has tried to evict him four times. His neighbor, Antonia Allen, has received five eviction notices. And it's causing me no end of uh, stress. You know, I, I, I wake up in the morning, it's the first thing I think about, and the last thing I think about when I, before I go to bed at night. You know, I'm always wondering, you know, are me and my cat going to be living in the street? You know? The eviction notices started in 2013. Landlord Brent Wolverton tried to evict everyone living in the house, saying a property manager was going to move in. The residential tenancy branch shut him down. He soon tried again, singling out Allen. Wolverton lost again. In December, yet another eviction notice, this time saying his sons planned to move into the house. That eviction attempt was thrown out on a technicality, and so you guessed it, Wolverton tried yet again. This time, the tenancy branch ruled that the reason he gave for eviction wasn't in good faith. And so, just a few days later, this past Sunday, there was another eviction notice on the door with the same reason listed. Wolverton is hoping for a more sympathetic arbitrator. 
The case has got the attention of the renters MLA. It's wrong. Uh, these people should feel safe in their homes. They're following the rules and uh, I, I think the man is acting in bad faith by just putting up eviction notice after eviction notice. The value of the house was assessed at more than $10 million last year. Wolverton has left most of the rooms vacant as people move out. With just Brighton and Allen living here now, Wolverton collects a little more than $900 in rent each month. He wouldn't agree to an interview on camera, but told CBC News, I'm not doing this to harass the tenants or for any malicious reason. This is just simply the way the system works. This is the only path I have available. Housing Ministry staff sent a written statement saying the tenancy branch doesn't have any sort of limit on eviction attempts, but tenants have the right to be free of harassment and a right to peace, quiet and privacy in their homes. The director of a new tenancy branch compliance unit is aware of the case and is investigating further. Yeah, we get the, the eviction notice again on Sunday. For Brighton, who's retired and lives on a fixed income, paying $365 per month for rent, housing alternatives in the city look grim. So he plans to continue the fight against his landlord. What choice do I have? It's fight, fight, fight for my place or move to the street. Rafferty Baker, CBC News. Vancouver. A Langley mother has taken her fight to ban smoking in condos all the way to the BC legislature. Naomi Baker traveled to Victoria with her baby girl to present a 17,000 signature petition to politicians. She's been fighting smoking problems with a neighboring unit in their condo building for years. Her biggest concern, secondhand smoke. Well, today, the provincial ministers of health and housing agreed to meet with her. I think it is going to be a matter of different steps. I think the other thing that people have talked about is this clause, you know, for renters. In those cases, often the building owners are wanting to go smoke-free and there's, there's grandfathering clauses. And so then it can take 30, 40 years <laughs> until the last couple smokers actually move out and yet they're affecting all the people around them. Uh, but there are Her MLA, Liberal Mary Polak, has encouraged the issue seems to have support from all three parties. She believes changes could be made at the provincial level under the Tobacco and Vapor Products Control Act. Well, home prices in the Fraser Valley up last quarter, despite signs of a downward trend for much of Greater Vancouver. Now, Langley saw the biggest gain at about 2% year over year at just under $969,000 on average for home. Similar, smaller gains were seen in Surrey and Coquitlam with aggregate prices up less than 1%. Now, the rest of Greater Vancouver, not so lucky. The region's home price average decreased 1.5% year over year. Royal LePage predicts further declines in the coming months. Well, TransLink wants your input on a plan for the proposed Surrey-Langley SkyTrain. It's an idea many people we spoke to say would be good for the community. It'll be a great opportunity for the travelers that are out here and then getting into Vancouver or vice versa. We go into Vancouver a lot and we do that by car right now. We drive. Yeah, we commute yeah. in, so it would be really nice to have something. He thinks so too. However, a Surrey councillor is calling for interim freezes on development. Randall Ox says there's no point approving projects before a new land use plan is in place. Council will discuss Locke's motion April 15th. In the meantime, you can visit TransLink's website to give your feedback about the plan right up until April 26. More details about the days leading up to the expulsion of Vancouver MP Jody Wilson-Raybould from the Liberal Cabinet. That's after the break.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I, they will make me try less. Uh, I'll try to transit more when it goes more than 150. Gas prices soaring once again in Metro Vancouver today, reaching an all-time high, 167.9 at this Coquitlam station. Experts still blaming the price hike on BC's carbon tax increase and a gas shortage in the Pacific Northwest. We're learning more tonight about a man accused of sexually assaulting young girls in BC. 33-year-old Wesley Clarkson is facing charges in Windsor as well, where he's alleged to have assaulted the daughter of his friend this year. He's also been convicted of similar offenses while working as a babysitter in Ontario. New Westminster police continue to look for more alleged victims. Well, more details are emerging about Justin Trudeau's negotiations with Vancouver MP Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott before they were expelled from the Liberal Party. They, of course, have shared their side of the story, but now so are their former colleagues. And as Katie Simpson reports, there are some differences. Over the, leadership of the, Liberal Party. the urgent effort to keep Jody Wilson-Raybould on the Liberal team went right into this week. B.C. cabinet ministers who know her well were in her office as late as Monday, trying to reach some kind of truce. There were issues that, you know, that Jody raised, and I'm not going to get into the specifics because these were private conversations, but, you know, that, that simply were things that, that the prime minister and, and, and the caucus certainly couldn't, couldn't agree to. It became obvious there wasn't going to be a positive outcome, and um, the conversations just came to an end. Wilson Raybould and Jane Philpott were expelled from caucus 24 hours later, a move which brought to an end secret high-level negotiations to ease the internal tensions which have hurt the Prime Minister and his party. We've worked for uh, a number of weeks over the past while to try and uh, come together on a, on a, a path forward that would uh, restore some of the trust that had been eroded, and uh, unfortunately it was obvious that we weren't able to do that. I would... Um have liked uh, all along to have the Prime Minister come forward and accept some responsibility and to apologize to Canadians for what happened. As CBC News first reported last night, sources say Wilson Raybould came up with a list of at least five conditions she wanted met. It included firing three senior staffers, a public acknowledgement of wrongdoing by Justin Trudeau, and confirmation the new Attorney General would respect her decision in the SNC-Lavalin case. Reports about that last condition irked some of her former colleagues who now cry hypocrisy. But if the AG is supposed to be independent, what's a former AG doing directing a Prime Minister to direct the AG to, 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 to make a determination on a case when new evidence could be presented? The new Attorney General says he was unaware of any requests, not that he'd listen anyway. If someone tries to direct me uh, to do anything, uh, the Prime Minister's never tried to direct me. If someone else tries to direct me, uh, then they'll hear about it. From and yeah, that's the CBC's Katie Simpson reporting from Ottawa tonight. And tomorrow at 7.10, Jody Wilson-Raybould will be interviewed on CBC's The Early Edition. Again, you can listen to that interview tomorrow morning. That's at 88.1 FM, 6.90 AM in Vancouver. And at 6.30 on this Thursday evening, take a look at this live shot. Metro Town and Snowcap Mount Baker in the background there. Turned out to be a pretty decent day on the south coast, but the rain is coming back. Amy Bell's forecast is next.
Yeah, it's really relevant here in Metro Vancouver. I'm calling from CBC Vancouver News. There are so many stories in this city to tell and to explore. Are you available for an interview? Our listeners deserve an explanation. This. That's just anecdotal. It's really the perfect place to live. The fact that people come from all over and want to make a home here, that says a lot about the city. A prime chunk of downtown Vancouver land is up for sale. And yeah, just a block away from Rogers Arena, the International Village Mall, commonly called by its old name, Tinseltown, is one of three retail properties on the market as part of a package deal. But as Justin McElroy reports, anyone buying the mall will have an uphill battle in restoring its reputation. <laughs> Probably the only Vancouver mall with a saxophone Santa. And that's not the only way the International Village Mall is unique. When it opened in 1999, it was aiming for high-end shoppers with the glittering name of Tinseltown. But the reality is different. Empty storefronts, weird specialty shops, and a strange design. It all conspires to a mall that may be memorable, but isn't anyone's idea of successful. It's never really worked. Aside from the stores that are street facing, like the Rexall and the Starbucks, the McDonald's, but the interior, uh, people are going into the cinema, uh, but they're not really shopping the stores very much. Even the brochure listing it says it's remarkably underutilized in its current form, indicating a change, perhaps. I actually think it's, it's going to turn into some other kind of use. It, it's a great location for office, uh, for non-retail non commercial. Um, and there's lots of opportunities. It's a great location within a, an urban environment. But there are still plenty of people who love the mall and its independent stores. Well, we provide something that downtown Vancouver doesn't see a lot of, doesn't have a lot of. One-stop shop cards and games has been here for 12 years. Successful stores like Gunther's are able to make it work because they get the mall's unique vibe. There isn't a lot of what you would see in normal, not normal, but other malls. Um, in the downtown area. So yeah, we, we do generate a lot of loyalty because I think we are a mom and pop shop. The company selling the ball on behalf of the owners declining an interview request. So we don't know what they're hoping to get, but it's hard to put a price tag on a place like this. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Vancouver. All right, time for a look at the weather forecast now. Here once again is Amy Bell. Thanks, Mike. We're in for some wet weather. We had a nice little break today between systems, but uh, rapidly changing. We have quite a system sitting off the west coast. It's been making its way towards us all day. Uh, so we've seen increasing cloud, but after the early morning showers, we're not going to see anything in terms of uh, real weather until late, late tonight and early tomorrow morning. But when it arrives, you'll know it's going to pack quite a punch. So we'll see this first wave hitting us Friday. And then as we make our way into Saturday, we're going to see this next wave. And that has the potential to not only bring very significant rainfall but very high winds to uh, many areas so as you'll see we'll see a very high wind and a lot of rain for the areas around uh, Tofino right along that west side of Vancouver Island so certainly those gusty winds have the potential to do some damage we could see some snow in the very high elevations and same story up around Whistler and Howe Sound uh, for the north you will see a little bit of snow but then you're going to actually improve and get into the sunshine by Sunday however most of the province is going to be dealing or the southern half of the province going to be dealing with very wet weather for several days. So as you can see, that is a very wet forecast. Uh, we'll see those temperatures still hovering around 12 in Comox, Tofino. Uh, so much of Vancouver Island just very soft in. And then as I mentioned, uh, a lot of rain falling along the west side and a lot of wind heading your way. Uh, Whistler at 10 degrees up on the mountaintop, you will get some snow and mild and wet out in the Fraser Valley. Now, as I mentioned, it's the north side, uh, north half of the province dealing with snow just really for tomorrow and a bit on Sunday, but then you get back into the sunshine. This system, though, making its way in towards the central and southern interiors, bringing rain later in the day tomorrow and Saturday, and then you will see things starting to uh, stay fairly wet and mild. Uh, we will see Cranbrook at 11 degrees, 13 for Kamloops, and wet for the Okanagan tomorrow. 
Taking a look at our five day forecast, uh, we will see temperatures holding steady around 13 tomorrow. So it is still a little bit above seasonal average. Saturday, we see that cool down as those cooler winds pick up. So that's the stormy one. And if you haven't gotten out there to get those pictures of the, um, the blossoms, the cherry blossoms, the plum blossoms, that combination of rain and wind is going to bring a lot of them down. So get out there today, get out there while you can. Sunny or Sunday is rainy, same for Monday. Tuesday, I think we'll see another break between systems. We'll get some sunshine, but then it disappears for Wednesday. Thanks very much, Amy. Ethiopian Airlines has released its preliminary findings into last month's deadly MAX 8 crash. Coming up, the data that reveals a struggle between the doomed plane and its pilots. We are now learning the pilots of that Ethiopian Airlines crash that killed 157 people last month did all they could to try to save the aircraft. As Jacqueline Hansen reports, despite that, they could not pull the Boeing 737 MAX 8 out of a nosedive. Data from the crash suggests there was a struggle between the Ethiopian Airlines plane and its pilots. The Ethiopian government says the findings rule out pilot error. The crew performed all the procedures repeatedly provided by the manufacturer, but was not able to control the aircraft. That seems to point to the aircraft's anti-stall system, known as MCAS, that was new to the MAX aircraft. It's supposed to lower the plane's nose if it pitches up too fast. Since repetitive, uncommanded aircraft nose down conditions are noticed in this preliminary investigation, it is recommended that the aircraft flight control system related to the flight controllability shall be reviewed by the manufacturer. It's unclear how exactly the pilots responded. These initial findings don't go into the step-by-step -step final moments of the flight. But after the deadly Lion Air crash of the same 737 MAX aircraft in October, Boeing recommended that pilots turn off the anti-stall system if there are any issues and fly manually. 
It appears the Ethiopian Airlines pilots tried to do that and still weren't able to save the plane. We were fairly confident that their recommendations from the first accident um, would have solved the, the second accident, if you like. But in this case, it's still completely open. They say that they'd followed the recommended procedures from Boeing, but the plane still crashed. So the Boeing position is actually very awkward at the moment. Its CEO displayed his confidence in the aircraft yesterday with a test flight on the 737 MAX. The company was supposed to submit a software fix for approval last week, but it says it's not ready. Today's findings may complicate things further for the company, as there may be even more for Boeing to figure out before it's absolutely certain the aircraft is ready to take off again. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Well, some of the world's top marine mines are in Moscow this week, trying to save nearly 100 orcas and belugas from what's been dubbed a whale jail. It could be one of the largest mass releases of captive animals ever, but as the CBC's Chris Brown reports, it's no easy task. Whale conservationists have never tackled a problem as large as this. They want to free 87 belugas and 10 juvenile orcas from these pens near Vladivostok, caught as part of a shadowy trade in selling live animals to Chinese marine parks. Faced with the backlash, Russia's government took the unusual step of asking for international advice. It invited Jean-Michel Cousteau, son of renowned ocean explorer Jacques Cousteau, to help come up with a plan to release them. It's not easy, but it's going to happen, hopefully, for most of them. Freeing this many whales has never been attempted before, and it's fraught with challenges, says American conservationist Charles Vinnick, who's also part of the advisory team. You have to think about how do you transport them safely and humanely to an area where they can be released, where there's sufficient food and adult whales to help them learn what they may not have learned as youth when they were captured. While environmental groups such as Greenpeace are generally supportive, I have some concerns that some of these whales may not be released. Whale researcher Gregory Sadolko fears the companies that used a legal loophole to catch the whales could still end up selling some of them. Those companies, on contrary, they are still hoping and, uh, as far as I know, lobbying for uh, at least some of those animals be left in their possession so they can sell them as, as planned. It's possible some whales died over the cold winter and others may have caught diseases. So, Cousteau's team plans to spend the next week studying the animals, yet he cautions with rehabilitation issues to consider, all may not be let go immediately. It may take years, we don't know yet. While Russia has moved to close the loophole that allowed these whales to be caught and sold, it still permits whales to be captured for scientific or educational purposes. It's proposing a quota of 10 orcas for next year. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Now here in Canada, a bill aimed at making it illegal to keep and breed whales, dolphins and porpoises in captivity has taken a big step forward this week. Bill S-203 passed the Commons Fisheries Committee on Tuesday, first introduced back in 2015. If it makes it through Parliament before the next election, it will bring in fines up to $200,000 on parks and aquariums found in violation. Right now, Marineland in Ontario is the only facility committed to keeping the mammals over the long term. The Vancouver Aquarium ended plans to hold all cetaceans last January, though Helen, a Pacific white-sided dolphin, is still at the facility for now. Students in Ontario walked out of classes en masse today, protesting changes to class sizes and curriculums. But as Lisa Zing reports, the government says the students are being used as pawns. From Mississauga to Richmond Hill to Toronto, students protested the premier. I'm here because what Doug Ford doing is completely unacceptable. His budget cuts... It's putting one of my favorite teachers out of a job. We're the future, and he's putting our future at risk. Our education. Our choice. The protest, dubbed Students Say No, is in response to the education changes announced earlier this month. No cuts to education. 
That includes high school class size averages going up from 22 to 28, an overhaul of the math curriculum to focus on fundamentals and financial literacy, and a cell phone ban. The province also announced a revised health curriculum that will teach gender identity and consent. Students are calling that revision a victory after many of them, along with parents and teachers, staged several protests in the summer and fall. Today they're hoping for the same result, especially after several school boards announced hundreds of job losses. Soon after the walkout, elementary students joined in, calling on the government to reverse the change to class size averages. Why are you here? Um, I'm here because I don't support the education cuts, just like all my fellow students out here. Yeah! We are here to protest for our future. We're here to show that we have a voice and we're going to show what we want. Giving us notice. At Queen's Park, education dominated the debate again. What does the Premier have to say to students who are already tired of being told to expect less for their future? This is about the union bosses telling the teachers and the students what to do. School boards are warning the Premier that his plan will have disastrous consequences. We saw what happened under the Liberals. We saw what happened with the big union bosses when they, well, I guess there's no Liberals in here. So a lot of blame being put on union bosses today at Queen's Park. I spoke with some some of those leaders and they say they absolutely had nothing to do with organizing the students. Lisa Shang, CBC News, Toronto. Well, this Saturday will mark one year since the devastating humble Broncos bus crash that killed 16 people and injured 13. As the CBC's Karen Pauls reports, a memorial service is happening this weekend, but not all of the surviving players will be there. Like most university students at this time of the year, Caleb Dahlgren is finishing up assignments, cramming for exams. Studying's going well. It's, uh, it's good. My roommate and I work hard at school. But most students haven't had the year he has. He was one of only 13 people to survive when the Broncos team bus hit a semi-truck that blew through a stop sign on their way to a playoff game. When we met him last May, Dahlgren had just been released from hospital, recovering from brain, neck and back injuries. So let's just stick to rotations, just a little bit this way, a little bit this way. And he dedicated his rolling. life for those who were lost. I miss him, I love him very much, and I'll live the rest of my life for them. Soon after, he accepted a spot on the York University hockey team, the Lions, encouraged to go by one of his Broncos coaches who had played there for five years. My cross has had a, like the tremendous influence on my life. And it just has that kind of warm feeling inside that I'm following his footsteps. Yeah. York head coach Russ Harrington says he never wavered in his commitment to Dahlgren despite his injuries. When Mark Cross, who's the epitome of being a lion, says someone else is a lion, it made it very easy to make a decision on, on Caleb. Cross's legacy still lives here. Our culture uh, has completely changed over the last few years because of Mark. He set standards very high for himself, for his teammates, held everyone accountable to that. Um, and I think moving forward, we all try and live our lives the way uh, Mark did, and that's with character, respect, optimism, sacrifice, and selflessness. Dahlgren was front and center at the Mark Cross Memorial Game and during a special tour in Saskatchewan. All the while working on his own recovery, getting stronger. Oh, good try. Twelve months later, Dahlgren is still not cleared to play in a game, but his coach says he plays an important role on the team. Caleb brings an energy and a positivity. He's an inspiration with what he's overcome in the past 12 months. As the only captain on the team to survive, Dahlgren has stepped up time and time again to speak on behalf of his teammates. But I thought that the nation needed somebody to talk about it, to hear it from. And so if that had to be me, then that had to be me. And I wanted to step up for them. I think uh, leadership isn't just something that you do for a season. I think it's the way that you carry yourself for the rest of your life. But he won't be at the memorial service in Humboldt on April 6th. He and some of the other injured players will gather privately, finally ready to watch video of the Broncos' last game together.
I think that'll be an emotional time for sure, but it's a celebration for me. I want to celebrate their lives of everybody on that bus, and especially the 16 that aren't here anymore. Dahlgren says he will never forget, and he knows Canadians won't either. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Toronto. A violinist is donating his time in schools, all in an effort to bring discipline and routine for at-risk kids. Meet the children in the Hammer Band next. Friday on the early edition, we'll talk about an effort underway to get more women in the Sikh community involved in politics. A special event takes place this weekend, hoping to spark a conversation about why it's important for Sikh women to have their voices heard. A violinist in Toronto is teaching music to hundreds of school children at no cost. As Ali Shaysan reports, he says the students inspire him and says that music is the key to many good habits. I show them how to put the violin in the case and take it out. I show them how to tighten the bow. Of course, they cannot tune the violin, so I do that. And then they play two, three notes, and their eyes go absolutely wild with excitement. Concert violinist Mosher Hammer has led orchestras, but his most inspiring performance is amongst a symphony of grade schoolers. And when I grow up, I want to play the violin too. Principal Bual says they're in an extracurricular desert. They don't have access to those programs outside the school. And, and they're very important to our students for their social and emotional well-being. I heard you playing along beautifully. How long have you been doing this? Um, about two years. I love to sing and I love to listen to music. It gets me really relaxed. This is Bertha 2. Bertha 2. Who's Bertha 1? My bicycle. I love it. I just feel he's become a leader, and Hammer Band has helped him become that. And he's really thriving. I'm so proud of him. The Hammer Band program has been around for almost 15 years. Now, with a team of violin teachers and donated instruments, they're in over 40 schools in priority neighborhoods. Hammer says music teaches lasting lessons. 
how important it is to be on time. It's what it means to be responsible. My violin is special in my own way because I can use it to make beautiful sounds. The kids take the violins home, along with a sense of confidence. Who knows where it will take them? Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Love that story. Mm -hmm. I heard a lot about sports coaches talking about, you know, getting them ready for, for yeah. life and music. Good and habits through, uh, through music. Yes. Hammer time in Ontario there. And speaking of music, mm -hmm. pop superstar Celine Dion will start her first North American tour in a decade in her home province. Yes, that would be the province of Quebec, and that's where it's all going to start in September. Yes, and Dion spoke with the CBC's Zuleka Nathu yesterday after announcing she's wrapping up her Las Vegas show. I think it's time for a change. Time to hit the road. What's left to say? This person working anymore. <laughs> it's a big chapter. Maybe some people thought that, okay, she's gonna be 51. Maybe she'll take a break, you know? <laughs> Maybe it's about time. <laughs> I want, I'm gonna explode. I'm so happy. I'm so excited. I'm part of my team. I'm part of my life. I found passion. People are sending me amazing songs. I'm freaking out about my album. I think it's gonna be the best tour. The courage word for me, it's exactly the way I feel. For three years, it's been tough to talk to the children, raise the children, loss of my husband. Um, am I gonna sing again? And at the same time, it's like, I feel like I'm in charge of my life. So the only thing I can do is to be the best of myself. I don't need to be in competition. I never did, I never will. I cannot be the best of everybody, but I can be the best of me. And you know what? Because I don't need to prove anything, things started to get better. I'm, I'm enjoying my life so much. I'm 51 years old, and I'm like at the best of my day. Very nice. Looking forward to it. September in Quebec, then possibly April here. April 17th in Vancouver. Very good. Yes. That's it for us. We're going to leave you with some, take a look at these gorgeous pictures. The cherry blossoms out. Beautiful. Right, right in downtown Vancouver. Wow. Look at that. Very nice. Nice way to leave you. Dan's and here at uh, 11 o'clock. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> was he in the shot? <laughs> Dan's here at 11. He's always here. Dan's always here. <laughs> Have a good night.